no mai hara mai ki te fare wananga nei ki te kura tatai ture mo te kore ro te nei te nei ata no reida te na tatai kato. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cowan Jones, uh, and I'm a member of the faculty here uh, at the Law School of Victoria University. Uh, and I wanted to, I'm very pleased to see everyone out bright and early this morning. This is a fantastic turnout. But um, um, no, no less than I'd expect for, for such a star, all star panel that we have today. Um, so the, the, the title of the panel today is, is um, uh, TJ and TK, Māori Traditional Knowledge in the All Blacks brand. And of course, picking up on the idea of uh, the fact that um, TJ Piranara, I think, has kind of come to be seen as, as a bit of uh, the face of, of, of all the Māori stuff that goes on uh, in the All Blacks to some extent. Um, and so thinking about that relationship with, with traditional knowledge, Mātauranga Māori, um, and uh, I think you'll see our, our panel members pick up on that, not just in the context of the All Blacks, but, but thinking about uh, rugby in a broader sense uh, and, and those wider issues around intellectual property and traditional knowledge. So I'm just going to quickly um, give a, a brief introduction to our panel members and then um, I'll let them uh, have their time because uh, they are who you've come to hear and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions and conversation at the end as well. So I'm really pleased today to um, have yeah, three really amazing women who have all done fantastic work uh, in this field. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to first of all hear from uh, Dr. Farah Palmer, uh, who's uh, from uh, uh, the Associate Dean at the College of Business at Massey University, and many of you will also know her as uh, former Black Ferns captain. Uh, and she'll talk to you a little bit about the context of, of this work and the project that she and I are involved with here. Um, and we'll also hear from uh, Professor Susie Frankel, who's one of my colleagues here at the Faculty of Law, and many of you will know uh, has written extensively uh, around issues in relation to intellectual property and internationally recognised expert in that field. Uh, we also have um, Aro Hamid, uh, again an internationally recognised expert in the field of, of traditional knowledge, uh, and uh, many of you published extensively in this field. Uh, and engaged extensively on the international stage on issues, particularly around indigenous peoples uh, uh, and traditional knowledge and intellectual property issues. So, with that very brief introduction, um, I'm going to hand over the time and we're going to start with Farah. So if you could join me in welcoming her. Um, Susie, rawa ko aroha, uh, kia uh, and welcome to you all. I'm actually really nervous because I'm sure there are lots of people out there who are um, better experts and more legal eagles than me, but that's the whole purpose, isn't it? I'm really um, happy, Cohen. Thank you so much for organising everything, uh, and I'll kind of kick things off and give you my um, understanding of what this means. So I'll just get to my presentation, that one there. I've got loads of photos, um, and like what Cohen mentioned, I did think, gosh, are we... Are we doing the right thing by using TJ's name? Uh, but he does tend to be the embodiment of Taonga Tukuiho in rugby. And a lot of people say, what is Taonga Tukuiho? Um, it's those kind of uh, precious things that we consider to be artefacts and that are passed on from generation to generation that are based in traditional knowledge. So I think that's why we thought, you know, with the TJ name, it would be quite catchy, and the All Blacks will bring you all in. Um, but it's based on a research project that we got funded by Ngāpai or Te Maramatanga, and uh, a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago, uh, this kind of proposal came up for doing some research on resilient legacies, manawa te taonga tukuiho, and I was like, oh, yeah, what's that? So I did a bit of exploring around what they wanted, and I thought, wow, 
this is kind of all my worlds aligning. I'm in the rugby space. I'm in a business school. I had a sociological background. Uh, and I am on the New Zealand Rugby Board. So, um, and on that, I'd like to acknowledge you, Stuart, in terms of being legal counsel at New Zealand Rugby. So I'm, all, I'm on all of those things, and how can I align my worlds and do something? And it literally was the fastest research application I've ever done. <laughs> and we got it. Uh, so these are my research questions. I actually had to try and find them because <laughs> I couldn't remember what we said we were going to do. Um, but I, I wanted to know what are Taonga Tukuiho in rugby contexts and how are these incorporated into the business of rugby in terms of education, commercial elements and also cultural purposes. So trying to do an inventory of what Taonga Tukuiho are. And then what's the impact of commodification of these Taonga Tukuiho in that rugby space in terms of what impact it has on the mana and modi of Māori and also rugby stakeholders. And then what are the implications of innovative <laughs> technologies, cultural rights, cultural transformation, all those kind of things. So it's big um, and we've, we've only got another year to get this all done but we have made some progress. And the last one, how are Taonga in rugby contexts reinforcing or challenging hegemonic ideologies or stereotypes around things like race, gender and identity. So those are the kind of the broad questions. Uh, and so I also had a little kind of think, well, why 262 kind of relates a little bit to what we're doing here in terms of those kite in the Ko Aotearoa Tēnei report. So, you know, in terms of taonga works, taonga species and kawenata aurere. And I think these are all things that relate to this topic as well. So I wanted to start by saying that Māori rugby has a proud legacy and actually the Māori um, natives team they were called in 1888-89 were the first rugby team from New Zealand to tour overseas. So if you're looking at, at the whakapapa, it's got a longer whakapapa than the All Blacks. Uh, and we weren't sanctioned and I say we all the time, because I feel included in this, um, in 1910, so that was the very first official Māori rugby team. We've also been involved in decision making for a long time. From 1922, a Māori advisory board was established, and to this day we have a New Zealand Māori rugby board that is uh, part of New Zealand rugby. So these are books that have been written. Tom Allison was someone who was the one that kind of decided that they'd do the haka before the game, that they would wear a black jersey, that they would have a silver fern. So all of the things that we see as iconic today were started way back then. So what do Māori value about rugby? And I, I say rugby slash Māori rugby because there's rugby that Māori are involved in, which is everything, and then there's a particular type of rugby, which is Māori rugby, where we have tournaments and things like that. So for me, Māori see that they can achieve success and satisfaction in rugby, and I've gotten brackets there as Māori, sometimes, not all the time. Tanga, so team bonding that happens due to having a shared history, either that being in rugby or due to whakapapa. Um, a sense of well-being on and off the field. And I've got question marks after all these because these are assumptions sometimes and we haven't really tested them. A place where Māori culture is valued and a pathway for our Māori players and leaders to, to aspire to bigger, higher things. So what is the, um, the kind of current lay of the land around rugby. So these are just some recent figures. So you'll see that we are heavily invested in rugby. So in terms of, I think there are 27% of our players are Māori um, nationwide. And although um, teenage boy numbers are dropping off generally for Māori boys, it's kind of not, it's growing. And uh, women's rugby is growing and a large portion of women who play rugby are Māori. But what about in the leadership levels? You know, we've got lots of Māori that volunteer in rugby, and we've also got quite a good um, if you want, transfer rate from being amateurs to professionals in the playing sense. So what is the value of Māori rugby to New Zealand rugby? It's, I think it's quite valuable. Um, if you look at all the marketing and uh, things that are put out there in the public space, there's a lot of that tikanga, uh, te reo element that's included. So national Māori teams are unique and they're authentic Indigenous products that have this mystique 
that uh, some of our global partners want to be a part of. So it has global appeal. And Tikanga Māori promotes rugby as a unifying and inspiring product, you want to call it that, locally and globally. So our vision is to be unifying and inspiring, so this helps. And Community Māori Rugby, which is that Māori Rugby brand I was talking about, is about celebrating the passion for, ma for, for rugby and Māori identity. So that's the picture down below. So I will use we a lot because I kind of feel a part of all of these things. Um, I have an identity crisis sometimes. And Māori are heavily invested, as I said. So I'm just going to put some pictures up there. So this is a, an example of a team that goes to the Māori rugby tournaments and they stay at Marae and they do everything in a tikanga way. So should we protect this as a taonga? Um, the jersey has a lot of Māori designs on it and those are my children wearing uh, Chiefs jerseys that they were given. So I don't have, I'm neutral. <laughs> but you'll see that there are Māori designs on those jerseys and my understanding is they're probably one of the um, most popular jerseys because of those Māori designs. Um, recently at the All Blacks reunion, um, uh, Chris Liddell has been going around trying to get some All Blacks jerseys and buy them at auctions and so forth. So he did manage to buy uh, one of George Nepia's jerseys. And you probably can't see it in the blue writing, but what it, what it is there is saying that, um, you know, these are taonga and we should um, repatriate them and bring them back to Aotearoa, some, they're all over the world, and also the whānau um, of him, of uh, George Nepia, wanted those jerseys to come back. But where are they going to be? Who's going to look after them? What's going to happen? So we're talking about those things now. Um, if you were around during some of the Lions tour, Fresh and Irish Lions, Tu Te Ramainga Iwi was something that we were trying to encourage everybody to sing. And, uh, you know, the whānau were asked if it was OK to use Tu Te Ramainga Iwi of the composer. So that was a nice thing to do. You know, but there are also issues around how that can be used. The Māori All Blacks are another taonga tukuiho. They are often um, used to enhance those relationships with partners like AIG. So this is in 2014. They will go to the AIG headquarters and do a little cultural session and everyone absolutely loves it. Um, there's a poster. It's got all of these elements um, of IP involved in those posters as well. And, of course, whenever there's two teams are meeting, there's an exchange of gifts. So this is uh, Luke Crawford, the Komatua for New Zealand Rugby, handing over a gift to the Fijian delegates, and it's, a, it's the design <coughs> on the jersey on a, on a piece of rako, on some wood. So in terms of exchanging those, what happens to them? That's one of the questions I want to know. Um, and I'll show you a picture later of the taiaha that were given to the British and Irish Lions when they, if they won, they got them, and if the New Zealand teams won, they got them. So I'm curious to know what's happened to these taonga that we give to teams. You'll also see the Māori All Blacks are wearing um, the bone carvings, and that's also their taonga. Te Reo Māori is a taonga as well, and these are just some stories of players who've feel that they want to protect their reo. And these are the Allison brothers who are all based in Japan now. And they in this article, they talk about the fact that they're trying to hold on to their reo and their tikanga, um, but they all want to come back home. So te reo Māori is also a taonga. Um, Luke, that's a picture of Luke. And I was um, lucky enough to be a part of the Māori All Blacks as a researcher in 2014. And these are some of the comments the players made about the culture sessions they'd have. Every night they would have to do an hour worth of culture sessions. Some of the players would roll their eyes. But um, Luke does a really good job of taking them on a journey. And this is just giving you an indication of some of the positive comments from the players about those sessions. Once again, another poster every year, uh, Tiki Edwards and, and a, and a um, friend of his who's a designer get together and they kind of come up with this concept. And on the back of the poster, there are these values on there and explanations as to how they relate to the team. Uh, a 
in New Zealand rugby, we've got the rugby way, which you know you all understand. 2016 wasn't a great year for rugby. There was a lot of publicity around off-field behaviour, and since then we've had a respect and responsibility review, and we have a respect and inclusion strategy now. So the rugby way is trying to change the culture within uh, rugby. And initially it was just in English, but I kind of suggested that maybe we want to show that we are um, a tiriti led kind of organisation and we want to include te reo Māori as well. These are still getting out there and trying to be implemented at all levels. Now this is, um, we have Māori rugby and the feeling in the Māori rugby environment is very different to other high performance rugby contexts, very relaxed as you can see there, very much about tanga, and I think we should protect that as well. Uh, this is a picture of, those are my toes. Um, but this is the way that we do like coaching workshops and uh, lead, uh, rangatira workshops for Māori rugby uh, and it's great, you know, I think for some people this is really what they want to do, connect their identity to their passion for, for rugby and that's one of the um, taiha that is, was given, gifted to the team that won so yeah, I'm really curious to know where they've gone to I have to get some travel overseas to find that out. So what about our rangatahi in terms of are they taonga kind of like passed on to you by their whanau to look after and protect while they're playing rugby? So we've got lots of activities for our rangatahi in terms of rugby and we've started to move into the under 18 space and we, we kind of, we're not high performance but we want them to aspire to greater things and um, you know, it's amazing to see some of them develop and grow. So this is the under-18 boys team, and we've just added an under-18 wahine team as well, marae kura. Because um, for me, it's important that we have that balance of mana wahine and mana tāne. So this is just... Um, Jeremy Hapita was a PhD student of mine. I promised him I'd put this up because he couldn't come today. But if he's got an article out there about kamate and is it a commodity to trade or a taonga to treasure. Uh, so really he kind of did a bit of an analysis of three ways that the haka was used around the Rugby World Cup 2015 and then said that the Attribution Act appeared to have minimal impact on how it was used or attributed. Uh, he also interviewed some pukinga, or kaumatua if you want to call it, from these iwi, and they all said they wanted to see greater protections in place for the use of this taonga. So New Zealand Rugby has responded to these um, concerns. There's now a haka kaitiaki group within the All Blacks. There, there is the appointment of Luke Crawford as the Māori Cultural Advisor within the organisation. There's a cultural subcommittee on the Māori Rugby Board and there's a respect and inclusion programme that I mentioned in New Zealand Rugby, but we could do more. And I think, does, it, does the context of where the haka is performed or presented matter? And this is, um, I can't see it very well, but this is a uh, YouTube clip of the Black Ferns and the Māori All Blacks having a hucker off, really. But, you know, it was an intimate experience and it was just full of um, ihi, wiki and, and mana and it was really awesome. You've got the Māori All Blacks doing the haka, you've got those Māori rugby tournament teams doing the haka and then you've got teams like the Crusaders doing the haka. So does that matter? Um, uh, uh, some people should or shouldn't do it. And then, of course, there's the way around the Rugby World Cup 2019, how um, tikanga and rio and taonga were used in that context. So there was a lot going on about whether there was overuse of the haka or if it was a disadvantage to other teams, so forth. Um, you know, we could, we've, we've had those debates for years. So for me, it's about how can we protect what matters to, to Māori around this space. And this is a picture of the kōhatu, which is a stone that was taken from um, Tūwhare Tōa region and taken to Japan as a gift, and that was something New Zealand Tourism wanted to do. But I was really fascinated by the way that the whole process was managed. Um, I wasn't allowed to release this photo that I took on my phone until after it was launched on, on, their, on their platforms. Um, who who kind of decides how the whole tikanga around gifting the stone happens. You know, you can see cameras in the background, so you can imagine you're trying to do this kind of very 
um, traditional gift giving and then there's cameras and stuff all around the place so it was quite interesting looking at it and finished uh, and then people our people are our taonga and there are many maori uh, rangatira involved in, in rugby <coughs> wahine and tane so we want to make sure we look after them i'll just skip that so this is the last slide Really, I'm, I'm keen to hear from you because, and my fellow um, presenters because these are questions I have. So if you want to use the Tiriti principles about the power to decide, the power to define and the power to protect, what can we do to, to do these things better with regards to Taumata Kuihu and rugby? So thank you. Thank you, Cowan. Uh, I, I'd like to actually begin by talking a little bit about the power of Cowan Jones. So he's managed to uh, get a few of us here this morning quite early, but I wanted to take this opportunity. Many of you may know that Cowan is... Cowan, I've just renamed you. <laughs> Cowan is a very important part of our law school, and uh, he was promoted this year to Associate Professor, who's such a modest person that many of you may not know. to congratulate him amongst many friends as well as colleagues. So, uh, thank you very much, Vara, and I look forward to Araha's comments. Araha and I often end up in this room, right? <laughs> it's, it's great. Okay. Um, so, first up, we have to make a few confessions here. So, Cowan asked me if I'd be willing to talk, talk in this uh, panel and later in the workshop... So here's the thing, Farah. I really do not know very much about rugby at all. Now, just to underscore this, it, I, I had a conversation with a colleague about what the TJ really meant, and we really only just worked that out during the talk. <laughs> just in case you think I'm joking here. So we consider ourselves a significant minority of New Zealanders who really do not know the rules of rugby. OK, now, I'm going to tell you, I do know a bit about rugby because it's really hard to live here and not know it, but I'm also going to tell you I've been to one rugby game in my life. And this was at Twickenham in London in the UK. Now, why? Why? Why would I end up in a rugby game in the UK? Because don't people pay a lot to Air New Zealand to get there and do this? Well, I was a lawyer in London for a while, and there was this client function, and they thought, it's a New Zealand match. The All Blacks, Susie will want to go to that. And there I am, relatively junior lawyer, thinking, how can I just say no? <laughs> Susie, it's, it's just kind of not my thing. <laughs> so, you know, the perspectives, I give you a very non rugby yes. perspective. <laughs> um, and hopefully we, that, that creates a good c conversation. Um, the slide's really useful, so I was actually going to come, come to the slide along the way. So... We, you mentioned in your presentation, Farah, Y262, and I thought I'd just begin a, a, a brief mention about that. As some of you know, I spent quite a lot of time working with the tribunal on Y262. In fact, that's where I first met Kangwon, because he was working at the tribunal then. I think that whatever's become of Y262, there was a bit of a watershed moment earlier this year when, through Te Puna Kokori, the government announced that they were going to give a whole-of-government response to Y262. OK, good things take time, changes of government perhaps, <laughs> many things like that, but I do think that that's going to be quite an important moment and quite an in-depth response. There's been parts of Y262 that have been part Actually responded to here and there, and some parts life moves on, right? And I'll talk about that a little bit. Some parts are less relevant than they were, but other parts still remain very, very critical, I think, to the protection and honouring of Makaronga Māori and Taonga. So I'll, I'll come to some of that detail. I've made a choice not to give you too much legal detail on slides. After all, the coffee's just sinking in, and it's early in the morning. So it is useful to mention Kamate Kamate and the Haka. I think that we've got a 
another smaller session about that later, but I think that it really has become iconic in so many ways. It's become iconic both for the culture and the taonga it is, for the kaitiaki relationship with it, for the way in which we've had these bits of legislation around kamate, and I'll talk about that, but also for the way in which it's become emblematic, actually, of the debate around the role and function of intellectual property. And um, that it has also, of course, been quite an interesting personal journey for me because, as I've declared to you, I don't know that much about rugby. Having to understand more and more about kamate has been a real pleasure of learning and understanding it in the rugby context. I've actually found more complicated than understanding it in the iwi context, which is sort of not the what usual experience of New Zealanders, but as I've declared to you that me and rugby have an unclosed relationship. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Okay, so the question, and one of the questions that Farah framed really quickly, but I wanted to underscore what she said because I thought it was really a great line, is, is it a commodity to trade or a taonga to treasure? And to me, and from the perspective of someone who does a lot of research around intellectual property, what, one of the things that concerns me in the debate is that intellectual property is framed as the commodification side of this. And to be sure, the use of intellectual property enables things to be commodified. So when we're talking about intellectual property, there's a lot of it, and hello students who've listened to this many times, but if I focus on a couple of points, right, when we're talking about intellectual property, if we, if we use Kamate as a bit as an example as I go along, we are talking about, from the intellectual property view, definitely not from a Māori, Maharonga Māori view, the use of copyright and trademarks. So the easy part of this is we know that copyright doesn't apply because even if it ever did to the haka, then there are questions around its expiry and what it would protect and it just doesn't do the job, right? Now, when I first started on that research path, that wasn't a very well-known proposition, but it's a very well-known proposition. Now, and then we have trademarks and attempts to trademark words, kamate itself, logos, and then of course the silver ferns is another example. Now, these legal distinctions matter when you're thinking about commodification, and here's kind of why um, in so many ways. Now, if you study intellectual property itself, intellectual property is a mechanism, as I said, to commodify things, to commodify all kinds of features of culture, right? Even if we step outside of necessarily Mataronga Māori and its manifestations, then, you know, we all books are expressions of culture, whether they're good or bad books, right? Waiata are expressions of culture. Songs are expressions of culture. So intellectual property has this very intimate role with culture. Whether we frame it like that or not, I, one of the points I've made is that the word culture actually doesn't appear in most of our intellectual property statutes, but to be sure, the Ministry of Culture and Heritage at least knows it's a cultural concept, right? It really is. But an in-depth study of intellectual property law will tell you that it's also about protecting innovation. It's about providing the means to commodify your culture, to make a living out of it, but also to encourage innovation and development. And that's both true and not, right? But intellectual property law itself grants various levels of property rights, and there's a lot of nuance in there, we need not get into that. But what it doesn't do is ensure you the market or ensure you an ability to commodify anything. And so with an intellectual property scholarship, a lot of my work and some of my colleagues' work is talking about how intellectual property law itself, whilst it can set up a mechanism to allow commodification, in fact should be blind to commodification. Now, let me explain that in, in a particular way. Part of this comes out of the way in which investment law is now saying, but I've got IP rights, I've made an investment. But 
let me give you a simpler example. So shredded wheat is a very well-known American breakfast cereal, and essentially it's kind of obvious what it is, right? It's just shredded wheat, and it's, there's a lot of money in this trademark, shredded wheat. But Justice Brandeis, for those of you who've spent a lot of time in law school, hopefully know he was a bit of a big deal in his time, um, still remains a bit of a big deal, when he was hearing this case, should there be a trademark around shredded wheat, or does it just describe the product, he said, well, you're telling me it's worth millions and millions of dollars, but that's irrelevant to me. That's irrelevant to the legal question as to whether it should be a trademark. And so this is one example of how commodification is something that happens with intellectual property, but the value of the intellectual property is not how the law determines what is intellectual property. Now that has pros and cons, right? Now the pros are that therefore intellectual property should be neutral about who creates it, what culture is involved and so on. It has cons because intellectual property is not neutral about who it protects and what it protects and so on. Rather it sets out very specific mechanisms that are often individualistic, even if they're given over to teens to value. Now, why have I explained this to you? Because I think that intellectual property engages very heavily with culture, but it doesn't do it very well directly. So when in Y262, and both before and after that, there's a question of how do we protect Mataronga Māori in intellectual property and so on, one of the issues that comes out is, oh, well, you know, this isn't really about protecting culture. It's not about protecting the value of the ideas or the value of the culture. And that has often been used as a pushback against intellectual property type mechanisms to protect taonga. Now, to a certain extent, those statements are true, except that what I'm saying to you is that they're really mismatched frameworks, right? Because intellectual property is 100% about protecting culture. It just doesn't use those words in a way that levels the playing field. I didn't mean to make that terrible thing, but, <laughs> but it levels the playing field completely. It doesn't say, oh, well, therefore we recognise all cultures equally. But it is a mechanism to protect culture. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm suggesting that intellectual property should be used as the power to decide, the power to define, or the power to protect. Right? I'm not saying that mataronga Māori, taonga should be protected through intellectual property. Um, those of you who know my work know that I've never said anything of the kind, and that's quite the opposite. But what I'm suggesting to you is that these worlds operate in different spheres, but they actually have an awful lot in common. And when you start to see that commonality, then you can understand why, actually, for someone like me, who quite obviously not only doesn't participate in rugby, but you can clearly tell I'm not a Māori New Zealander, um, can see actually there's a really good claim to culture here, and what intellectual property shouldn't be able to do is to profit or to abduct or subsume another culture and not pay appropriate homage to it, right? Because intellectual property for New Zealand is, in a sense, and, you know, here I'm at risk of sounding like a policymaker, is, in fact, for all New Zealanders. But I actually believe that it ought to be, whether you're scientists, Māori, so on. And none of us will ever agree on every last detail, but that is a vibrant intellectual property community. Now, what I think is really important following the whole of government response to Y262 is what comes out of that. Now, I mentioned that some things have moved on. So here are some of the things that have moved on since Y262. So we have, and Araha is part of this, others here are part of this, we have, if we focus on trademarks to begin with, this Trademarks Advisory Committee in the Intellectual Property Office. Now, I think it's fair to say that whilst it's excellently run and the legislative intent is good, one of the points that's made in Y262, and not just, of course, for the tribunal, but because of the claimants, is it's kind of not enough, and it's not enough, right? What that committee can do is issue guidance, indicate that 
certain trademark shouldn't be registered if they're offensive to a significant section of the community, the legislation says Māori. It's a very effective committee, perhaps compared to its relatively new patent relative, but it still has limited powers, and 262 goes through the detail of both what are the problems with those limited powers and so on. So what's, the thing to understand about this committee is how we look at it within New Zealand. We think, OK, more needs to be done to recognise the value of maharonga Māori, to not allow third parties to misuse that, to misappropriate it. This committee is actually really radical in world terms. It's the only in-house committee in an intellectual property system that functions in that way. Um, the nearest equivalent, oddly, is scientific advisory committees within the United States Patent Office. It, it, and, and why do I say it's equivalent? Because it's an expert committee within a government framework, right? So it's not enough. We can see that. We can see that this does not give the kind of protection for Mataronga Māori, the kind of honour for Taonga. Now, I also, of course, don't actually think that the answer lies in intellectual property the law. The answer often lies in the kind of work that Farah and her colleagues are doing by actually, how do you deal with this? Terrible, isn't it? I was about to say on the ground, another bad one. <laughs> How do you deal with this actually when you're in action? And we have examples of this around the New Zealand Film Archive, the National Library of New Zealand. How do you deal with Maharonga Māori issues in action? And you can't wait for legislation or indeed IP law to catch up with any of that, so a lot of it gets sold. But this is where some of the outstanding parts of Y262 I think become really important. And this takes us, and I'll just spend a couple of minutes because I want to leave plenty of time both for Araha and for questions, into the international arena briefly. So the international arena, both for the negotiations for the protection of traditional knowledge, is a complex negotiation at the World Intellectual Property Organisation. One of its complexities is the politics around it and basically the reluctance of some major players in those international organisations to recognise that there should be some sort of global protection of traditional knowledge. There are many complexities, of course, in being an international organisation at all. But New Zealand has active roles in that discussion and is often looked to to provide advice and so on because we do actually have laws that function around Mataronga Māori traditional knowledge. Some countries actually have very good looking laws on the books but they don't really function, right? so, so that's another di difficulty. But there are limitations to that. An, an additional part of the equation is the role of trade agreements in New Zealand, so I'm going to focus on that and then, and then finish, and hopefully I've put a lot of issues out there for discussions and questions. So the Y262 claim actually, and subsequently other claims, did have discussion around the role of various iwi and Māori and so on participating in trade negotiations or indeed how these trade negotiations occurred without regard to treaty principles. So really they occurred just ignoring te tiriti, right? So there is discussion of that. But whilst Y262 sits there as a mechanism for legislative, legislative response, whilst businesses and organisations and sports just kind of have to get on with what they're doing. The government still is negotiating trade agreements. We saw a lot of coverage of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, then became the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. I reckon it's a special tool to lessen an agreement and then call it more comprehensive. I love that. <laughs> okay. And a lot of the debate around that was around intellectual property. But Many of what was in that agreement has been renegotiated, repackaged at other agreements. One is the Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership, which, if you haven't spent your time figuring that out, that's the ASEAN countries plus six, significant six, but it includes Korea, China, India, Australia, New Zealand, and that would be five, but there's one other there, and it'll pop out in a minute. <laughs> OK, so there's that, and we see many of these more extensive protections of an intellectual property featuring there. 
when the US pulled out of the TPP, they then start their own agreements and they start to up the level of intellectual property protection. Now, why does this matter? This matters because the more you change intellectual property, the harder it becomes to protect the parts of Mataronga Māori and Taonga that interface with intellectual property. <laughs> so whilst there's lots of Māori way and so on to actually do business and to protect Mataronga Māori, it's the interface with intellectual property that is really the focus of my research. And the stronger those IP rights become, the harder and the more conflict there might be in that interface. And although the claimants who've framed the problem with trade and negotiations would frame it differently, I would say that what's incumbent on the New Zealand government and its response to Y262 is to explain why the progressive increase of intellectual property rights as a trade dynamic is going so much faster than the local protection of Mataronga Māori. Because whether we say it's like this and like this and like this, and like this, the continuing inability to intersect effectively, I think, is the long term problem we're looking at. So, thank you. Teata Marie, Ye Uriyo no Ngati Awa, Ngati Pro, Ngatu Hoi, Ngati Tupare Tu, Tu Harangi. I'm going to give a disclaimer straight away. I had major dental surgery yesterday. I'm in pain and I'm swollen. And if I don't enunciate my words, this is why. So take that into account. Um, last night I was at a talk on the politics of collecting plants um, and looking at collecting and naming. And I usually in IP discussions around genetic resources and plants, this, this is quite a new field for me. But I want to start by first of all acknowledging that we're even having this conversation. Because if you look to the struggles of First Nations peoples in the United States around the use of um, really inappropriate images and names of their ancestors in the, by the sports industry as sports mascots. It's been an incredible challenge for them. And I think the idea that you could even have a discussion with board members of a, of a football team to sort through issues is way beyond their scope. So congratulations for bringing this together, for getting the research and for having this um, meeting. I want to start by just reminding us of a few things. So back in 1993, we had the Mātātua Declaration on the Cultural Intellectual Property Rights of Indigenous Peoples, developed here in Aotearoa, um, but it is considered a global Indigenous document, a declaration of how Indigenous people see the issues around cultural and intellectual property rights. And there are some very poignant points in that declaration that still remain um, vital today. One is an acknowledgement that mātauranga and culture, cultural heritage, is local. It's place-specific and it belongs to a people. They may not claim ownership the way that others claim ownership, but it is their heritage. Another thing the Declaration says is that the first beneficiaries of Indigenous heritage should be the direct descendants of that heritage. And only after that has been taken care of that Indigenous peoples are willing to share with humanity um, what they choose to share. But the choice is theirs, what they choose, who they choose to share it with, how it's to be used. It should be that way, not something imposed downwards. Um, indigenous rights around in intellectual property, cultural intellectual property are also um, contained within the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. There used to be three articles on it, but by the time it 
found its way through the negotiations. It's ended up just one article, Article 31. Uh, but it's a very powerful article because it does make the point that Indigenous peoples have the right to control, to maintain, to protect. And yet, um, even having these measures in place, having these acknowledgements sort of out there for a long period of time, really hasn't had the impact that we need to have in terms of the protection at local and national levels. Um, and that's a point that Susie made. I think in the case of rugby, it's, it's a blessing that the All Blacks have been so successful because then the association of the use of Māori culture is an association with success. If, however, the All Blacks weren't successful or if they go down, they slide down and they become less and less successful, you'll begin to see how all of this will unpick and it won't be. Um, right now, there's just an understanding that it's okay. It's okay because there's a huge association of strength and power and influence. It's inspiring of young to young people. It's something that we're proud to be associated with. But I do think, like a lot of New Zealand initiatives, it's by accident, rather than <laughs> it's by accident rather than by a carefully thought through, well developed strategy of using Māori um, culture and having the proper conversations about how to do that well. And I guess what I've learned from my thirty-something years of working in this field, nationally, Pacific regionally, um, locally, is that although intellectual property is a series of laws, a very specific purpose, it's also an umbrella term that we, we've just adopted in our vocabulary. So there's no need to get precious about the term because we all use it. It's a code term for, for everything that falls within the context of use of another culture, misappropriation of a culture, someone asserting ownership, someone being worried about are they losing control of how it's being used or, or are they being attributed. It's just a term that encapsulates all of those things. And we use the term quite liberally as the place where we have these conversations even though a lot of the conversation sits completely outside what can actually be achieved within the laws. So um, when we're asking the questions around what is, what we're using, how we're using it, I would always come back to these basic principles of acknowledging that whatever is being used belongs to someone. It was created by someone. Um, maybe an individual, if it's a contemporary design, but a community, a hapu and iwi, if it's a, if it's a historical design. And if the conversations haven't been had yet, I would think they have, but I would hope they have, then they need to be had. And nothing should be left to chance. Like, I think the All Blacks could get away with losing one match. If they're getting to like four, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how, um, you know, I think things could unravel really quickly. Um, so we, we've used this term mātauranga quite a bit. And what I would like to say about mātauranga is this. The Crown has no business in that field. It has absolutely no business there. Because Mātauranga is the essence of who Māori people are. Without it, there is no distinct culture. Māori have been able to survive to 2019 without a lot of land, slowly getting land back, but they have survived to be a strong, vibrant people because they retained Mātauranga. 
and that must never ever be lost. So within, um, Susie mentioned the Y262 report, I found it really interesting that the tribunal is very conservative in its approach and probably one of the strongest statements that it made in that report is an observation that the Crown had often acted in a hostile way towards Mataranga. So that's a strong statement for, for the um, tribunal to make. And it was interesting that for the chapter on Mataranga, they also called it um, when the Crown controls Mataranga. And when I first read that chapter heading, it really irked me. But then I kind of came to understand that actually the Crown does control a lot of Mataranga, and that's the whole point. It's controlling Mataranga that it doesn't, it should not. When you, when you think about this, Pākehā knowledge, would you have the Crown claiming to control Pākehā knowledge? <laughs> Components of it through through how we teach in, in schools and units, but knowledge itself. Um, so why do we pick a certain sector of society and say that their knowledge, above everybody else's knowledge, their knowledge, the crown has a particular role in controlling access to? And you know, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. So another way in which the rugby union, is, as you move forward looking at issues around Mataranga, is to support the efforts of Māori to have greater control, to be more proactive in the relationships that you foster with Māori at local level to do that outside of the Crown's um, arrangements, because it's really none of their business, and to do that as direct relationships with Māori. Um, my dream, my wish, is actually to create a Mātauranga Commission, something like a Te Tauraviri Te Reo Māori Commission, but something that's purely around Mātauranga, to have that um, staffed with entirely Māori, and not Crown-appointed Māori, but Māori, to be well-funded, to develop a vision of where Māori would like to see Mātauranga move into the future, and then to engage with those departments who are able to contribute to that vision. Um, I've said to other segments of MB, MB is the wrong department to have Mātauranga in it. It's completely the wrong department. Um, because Mātauranga is everything. It's spiritual, it's cultural, it's the arts. It's not just about the delivery of science. Um, so coming back to just, I guess time is of the essence, I want to give you the opportunity to ask questions. I guess the big thing is having integrity around the use of Māori. So you know that it's, it's so entrenched in the brand and we're, as a nation, generally pleased with the association. But it's about that inner reflection that says how is the use of Māori imagery, that association with the haka, with power, with strength, with warrior, how is that being integrated into a whole of organisation approach? How are Māori values part of that organisation? When Māori design principles are being used, are those being used through the use of Māori designers? Um, are there specific outcomes that are designed for Māori to benefit? and not just by accident, but you've actually planned for them to happen. And uh, how are things being tested with Māori before they go out into the public arena? So is there like this genuine involvement 
where everyone feels part of the development of a Māori narrative and a Māori rugby narrative, something that everyone can feel good about and, um, and therefore defend as well if something is going wrong, which is not going to happen with the All Blacks, of course. <laughs> Um, so, really, just with those initial thoughts, I will just say in closing, though, that this is amazing that we're doing this. And I really, I was just seeing uh, another court case in the US about sports mascots. And I feel so um, sad for our Indigenous brothers and sisters overseas because they are fighting just mega millions of dollars of corporate interests tied up in sports um, teams who just don't want to let go of the use of really bad images for their mascots. And um, to see that at least this has been done in a, in a tasteful way in New Zealand is really heartening. So, kia ora.